high school in 1967, and like a lot of guys, I think at that time they were drafting about 50 guys a month. I think yeah. a lot of you guys know it. And they were just. Well, I got drafted. Yeah, and I got drafted. Uh, my brother got drafted March of 68. I got drafted March of 69, and that was just the way it went. I went to school part time, then didn't cut it. Yeah, you had to go full time. And uh, like I said, they needed soldiers. So my brother and I went. He went a year ahead of me. He decided to go three years and pick his job. When you're when you go two years, the army picks the job for you. So exactly. yeah, I got infantry. And they, the guy I remember the guy said you you would be good in finance, but we need riflemen. So so I'm just going to show you pictures. This is the book that we wrote, and we did it because we both had you know we really very seldom talked about Vietnam even though we were both there at the same time. Mm -hmm. and uh, But it was an interesting point of view. I was in the infantry out in the field, and he was back in the rear, you know, a little bit better area. So our stories are a little different. Uh, you know, his is part one, mine's part two, because you know, he's the older brother. He gets to do number one. So, but uh, it, it, it's, like I say, if you have any questions along the way, uh, let me know, and we'll go right along here. And there it is, there's Vietnam, right out there by Thailand. And, and like I said, if, if you read enough books about it, if we'd have taken the DMZ and gone right across to Laos, the war would have probably been over in about uh, eight months. But we didn't. It was a uh, little politics at the time. Mm -hmm. Little stats on the 47,000 hostile dead, non hot 10,000, we all know that. That's friendly fire, a lot, of, a lot of accidents, a lot of, we didn't have GPS, we didn't have uh, the logistics that they have now, a lot of it was, uh, you know, a lot of mountain area, I remember many times we'd call in airstrikes and, you know, they'd give you, uh, the, before they drop the bombs or before they fire the artillery, they'd give you a, a, white, a white phosphorus bomb over the target. Well, we'd look up, it was right over us, we had picked the wrong mountain. We had called it in ourselves, so we had to cancel that. But that happened a lot. A lot of people got shot. Uh, 58,000 died in Vietnam. We had about almost over 2.5 million people served over there. So a lot of soldiers. You figure out what, at one time in the 69, when you were over there, it was about 500 and some thousand troops. That's a lot. Of, I mean, we have 120,000 in Afghanistan now. So basically, when you get drafted, you go to school. And I went to basic eight weeks at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Uh, from there, they pick you on to go to uh, AIT, which is Advanced Individual Training. You can be a cook, truck driver, mechanic, whatever it is. Army had about 300 jobs they had to fill. They had to run a city. Wherever they were at, they ran a city. So they'd have all these people. My job was going to be in the infantry. They needed riflemen, and so they sent me to Fort Polk, Louisiana. I did nine weeks there. And I remember getting there the first night. And it was rainy, it was hot, and the barracks were World War II. They were condemned in World War II. And the drill sergeant at 2 in the morning comes out and says, 99% of you guys are going to go to Vietnam. The other percent will die here. <laughs> 19 years old. What the heck am I doing here? But after that, my company commander in Fort Polk, I said, well, I'm ready to go to Vietnam. I thought I had good training at Fort Polk. He made, me, uh, he made a bunch of us volunteer to go to Fort Benning be an NCO, which is a shake and bake school. They give you, they make, in 12 weeks, they make you a sergeant. And uh, it was a school that was designed by the Nazis. The, they took what the, how the Nazis did their training for officers and they incorporated a lot of them. And this is, a, you can see the blackboard there and that's, they're teaching us how to call in bombs out there. It was a school. It was just like, it was a NATO school. They trained all the people everywhere. It was a classroom. It was 12 weeks. Every week, they flunked the bottom per certain percentage out. So we started with over 200, and I think we graduated 120. But they would just get rid of the bottom ones. But it was just like going, you go into a computer. In fact, it was the first computer I was around. It was at Fort Benning. You'd sit in there, and they'd show a movie, and they'd stop it, and they'd say, now press the button, what, would you, what should you do? And it was really, you know, you can teach all that we want, but let me tell you, when bullets fly, it's a whole, whole different ball game. But it was very interesting. Uh, that's uh, more how they teach you how to call in support. The tank, you know, I didn't, when I was in the 101st, we had no tanks because it was all thick jungle. But that's just more of the school, a bomb blown up, and, and that's all the equipment they told you, all the equipment that you're going to use on support. 
you can see those helmets, those are training helmets, and there's a 150 of us. This is the last week at Fort Benning. This is when the Rangers trained you. They took you for the last week and they taught you how to do everything, live out on the, uh, you know, live off the land and, you know, they tell you, but you got hungry, uh, eat some berries. Uh, if you get thirsty, drink the water unless it looks polluted. Uh, and if you're, you're protein, you need protein, catch a bird, kill it, and suck the blood out of it. And that's how you got your, your energy. We went over by just a regular, you know, welcome to Seaboard Coastlines, 18 hours to Vietnam. And uh, somebody made some money on this war because there was a lot oh. of it. <laughs> oh, let me tell you. Yeah. And you get over there and here's a, here's a typical bar. This is one of the few bars you go to. And if you look to the right here, you see all those sandbags. And that was everywhere. You see sandbags on the roof. But that was a, you know, that was a fancy little place. And uh, if the bombs start flying, you run right into there. Now, this is my first night over there. And I remember uh, sitting at the bar and, you know, you, you're a new guy and you look like a new guy. And the old guys going home looked right out of the movies. They had the bandanas on and, you know, and you know how that look is when they get ready to leave. They had that, you know, and they're 21 years old and they're old guys, you know, and... So they see me and they say, well, what's your MOS? And I said, 11B, and that's infantry. And they felt bad. They said, oh, you know, we'll buy him a beer. And usually they, you know, they usually mess with people. And they said, well, he's 11B, we'll give him a little break. And the cooks and the truck drivers, they sort of messed with it a little. And then I told them I was going to 101st Airborne. That's how I got picked. I didn't chose, choose this, it chose me. And the guy said, 101st, he said, you're gonna get wounded or killed for sure. And I said, well, this is great news. <laughs> And when I got to my unit, I eventually got to my unit, everyone I talked to was wounded once or twice. So it was just, a, it was sort of like the norm. Uh, this is a, a major highway. And you can see uh, it was military vehicles or, you know, on the side of the road, you see the rickshaws or whatever they're called, the motorcycles, but the roads were built for the military and that was it. They, uh, that's how they trained, that, and that's a major highway there. And this is the, this is our barracks. This is where I got to spend about a week uh, there, and it's to get used to the weather. And you see the big ditch to the left. That's when the bombs fly. You run out. You lay down in them. And you can see the barracks are just you know they got plastic on the windows. They look like somebody's garage. And the first night you get there, and you know everyone goes out. We're 20 years old. We're going to go have a beer. And they tell you when you get home at night. When you get back to the barracks, you have a cot. You sleep in. You pull your cot away from the wall because there's a two-by-four that runs and the rats are on there. And if, like a lot of guys will fall asleep and they'll have a potato chip or they'll be eating something salty and sugary, the rats, and if, you, if they pass out, the rats will start nibbling on you. So they make sure the old-timers would say, pull the, the cots away from the wall. And, but that was, a, that was the best living I had there. That was, that was about it. My brother explains that he had air conditioning, TV, and all that, but it just changed. You know, Air Force, if you were in the Air Force, they had it a little bit better. And I know a friend of mine over there, his brother came to visit us from the Air Force. And he said, I don't want to say anything, but you guys are living like dogs. <laughs> and we said, this is the best. What do we get out in the field? Then you got nothing. You should have seen it two years earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. There was nothing. But it was a beautiful country. I mean, it's that's... Uh, by the Asha Valley, it was just a gorgeous looking area. And uh, at night, uh, I did recon for a while. I was in a regular infantry outfit, the 120 guys. But my company commander wanted me to be a, a, a recon. So I took six guys, there were six of us, and they'd take us out to a mountain and drop us off for six days at a time. And they'd leave us on one mountain and pick us up six days later on another mountain. And uh, at night, when it got pitch dark, that whole mountain right there would be all campfires and it was all enemy and it would just be campfires i mean hundreds of them all over that mountain and i'd be sitting there and i'd be looking around to see if on this side of the mountain they had as many campfires because it really made you uh made you think about how how little we controlled some of this area and that's how we walked you see the number one man up there he's the point man you got about 10 15 feet between him and there's a slack man and then I was usually third. I was a squad leader. 
And uh, this is how you walked, and we all know why we walked like that is because if there was a booby trap or a grenade, some, something going off, it only gets one person. The old saying is one spread out, one round will get you all. So we made sure that we spread out and that nobody, uh, nobody got too close to each other. I remember one time I was walking and I stopped to talk to my, the radio man was right behind me. He carried the radio and I had the phone and the cord stretched. And the point man said, hey, I, I don't feel good about you know, this. And you went with a lot of intuition there. A lot of us did. He said, I don't feel too good about this. And he turned around and he said to me, so I turned around and told the, the radio man, I said, hey, be on your toes. You know, uh, point man doesn't feel good. Jim doesn't feel good about this. Well, just as I said that, they threw a grenade at me. And thank goodness I was right behind a tree. The grenade went off. But when a grenade goes off from here to that table away, well, I mean, that's a, you, I hit the ground right away. And, you know, and you're, you're just petrified. You're, you don't know. And I'm feeling for my legs because I know about two weeks earlier, this friend of ours got his legs blown off and he kept screaming how his legs were killing him. And I knew his legs were over there and he was right here, but he kept saying, my legs bother me, my legs bother me. And so when I was down there, I was like, Jesus, and, you know, and, but I couldn't have felt my face if I had to. But it was all pure luck. I mean, I took a step back to talk to him. They threw it there. We returned fire. They returned. They kept shooting. You could hear them loading the AKs, shooting at us. We'd shoot. And, you know, when you're in that situation, no one's standing around doing this. Everyone's holding that rifle over their head just trying to get them to put their head down. So, but that's how, you know, and then no, nobody got hurt on our side. We couldn't find any bodies on there, so we don't know what happened. We called in gunships but that's how it was walking and this is when the jungle was real thick then all of a sudden it gets like this it's either napalm agent orange or whatever we see how it clears out now the advantage of that is the enemy doesn't sneak up on you but the disadvantage is you don't sneak up on the enemy they can see you plain as day so there's a good and a bad to everything that's what we carry on our back you see i got like four yellow grenades on the front because I was a squad leader up front, if we got attacked, I would throw a yellow grenade out, tell the helicopter pilot, you know, 50 meters, I'd have my compass out, you know, 50 meters from there at 180 degree, well, I want you to, you know, hit it. And uh, God bless the helicopter pilots, because that, that's thick jungle in there. You can see the water, I carried eight canteens on my back. I carried, the basic load is you had to have at least two grenades, 21 magazines, of ammo and like three canteens of water. Well, I carried eight canteens of water and I carried my 21 magazines. Each magazine had 20 rounds of bullets. And I carried about 15, 12 to 15 grenades because you couldn't wait for the helicopters. You had to have instant artillery. But if you're in a jungle like that, I couldn't just sit there and wail away and throw a grenade like it was in you know, Jacob's Field because you hit a tree and it bounces back. <laughs> you're scrambling. So you really had to watch how you lobbed them. <clears throat> this is how we slept. And you can see we got to put a poncho liner up. Usually, they went, if the moon is real bright, they wouldn't let us put a poncho liner up because the enemy could look down and see it shine. So uh, there are many nights it just rained, and we all know how much it rains over there. You just get drenched. There's nothing you could do about it. You just sat there and, and got drenched. But that's how we, the guy on the left is my number one point man. Uh, the guy on the right was a platoon sergeant's radio man. You can see the radio hanging on his left shoulder. The guy on the left was a cigarette. His name was Don Goth. I just called his son, and he had passed away. I thought he was part Indian, but he wasn't part Indian. But he was, he was one of those point men that you would look in the, he would say, in about 100 meters, we're going to get ambushed. Look at the feet. Look at, and I'd say, well, how can the heck can you tell that from that? And he would uh, say, that guy is carrying a, a machine gun on him because his foot's deeper in the mud. And he had a good point on everything. Everything he said made sense. And he was, a, he was a good guy. He was one of the few guys that we ever let smoke pot out in the field. Because usually they, everyone said, well, there's a lot of pot in Vietnam. A lot of guys did drugs. For every one guy in Vietnam that fought, eight were in the rear. And when you're out in the field, no one wanted to get anybody loaded or anything like because I mean everyone had a rifle at least our platoon we were really worried about it now back in the rear 
you know, 19, 20 year old guys with beer and, you know, cheap beer and cheap bot, I, you know, they did whatever they wanted. But uh, out in the field, we were pretty scared about it. We were, we were not going to have that, you know, I don't want the guy next to me loaded. This is how we slept, three across, there was 30 in the platoon, uh, usually 10 positions at night. You can see how thick it is there. That guy on the right, he's just sleeping in. He's not, nothing wrong with him. But three across and we took turns from 9.30 to 6. Go to bed at 9.30. Uh, well, we, the, lead, or the guard duty started at 9.30. 9.30 at 11, 11 to 12.30. And but this way, a third of our platoon was always up. We'd be in one big circle, couldn't be too far away from each other because you can see how thick that is. It could sneak in between you, slit your throat. That was a big worry. But I can tell you, at 4 in the morning, it was, uh, if they ever attacked, it was usually about four in the morning because, you know, it's, that was the, uh, the crash and burn time. I remember my first night in Vietnam, I said, I'm not sleeping for a year. Well, you walk up and down hills in 107 degree carrying about 100 pounds on your back, you're, you know, you're just not gonna stay awake. You're gonna be dead meat. But that's how we slept and we stayed awake. And uh, for the most part, you know, once in a while we got mortared. A lot of time, a lot of downtime. You know, combat is a lot of, well, I'd say 98% boredom and 2% pure screaming hell, but that's how we do. Play a lot of cards. I'm to the right there, Tish is on top there. The guy on the left there is uh, John Frazier, the platoon sergeant. And he was probably, he's probably uh, a year or two older than me, but the average age I think was like 21, 22 in Vietnam. That's Nelson, he's getting ready to shave, he's got his, uh, helmet there. That's John Frazier again. Uh, Collins to the left here. You said but, he uh, just passed away? The, yeah, he passed away. And his, in fact, I talked to his widow, and she thinks it was Agent Orange. They couldn't prove it, but he had a lot of, uh, a lot of cancer and everything. And it could have been Agent Orange, because I remember a lot of times they'd tell us, you know, you have eight canteens, but it's a hundred and some degrees. You're walking through the jungle, you're drinking water, and, you know, you're drinking water that's close to a that temperature. It's not cool water, but when you run out of water and it's a hundred and some degrees, you'll drink anything. And World War II, they used to have air or water-cooled machine guns, and they had to get rid of them because the filthy water that they'd use in these machine guns, they'd run the, the machine guns through them. When guys got thirsty, they drank it. They didn't care. And I know over there, there were a lot of times they'd say, don't drink out of the water because the CIA poisoned a lot of the water. You could see dead fish all over, but it's 100 some degrees, we drank the water. We didn't care. We'd cut down banana trees and suck the middle of them out. But when you're thirsty, you'll do that. This is how we got our, speaking of water, this is how we got our water. That brown rubber thing in the bottom, this Chinook came in and dropped this off. And uh, this is, I don't know what the hill number is. If you ever hear like hill 802, hill 996, that's the elevation number, and that's how they give them their names. And that's how sometimes they, like this is right by Hamburger Hill. I think we, we, we cheated and called this Cheeseburger Hill or something. <laughs> like that. But, you know, we, were, we weren't really quick-witted. <laughs> but that's how we got our water. These Chinooks came in, there's a door gunner hanging out the door there. And, and that's how we get it. And that, when we lift the, leave that big rubber thing behind, the or NVA will come and they'll cut it and they'll make shoes out of it. They'll, make, they'll use it for something. We, we would leave a lot of stuff around. And it's our captain, Captain Skinner. We, uh, we had a good time. He was a real old guy. He was probably 25 out of West Point. And uh, but he got wounded about, I think I was there just a few months, and we had three company commanders. They just get boom, boom, boom. They, they just happen. We lose lieutenants. And, and this is the artillery. We would, when we got on a fire base, we had support for the fire base here. They would, uh, we'd have to protect them. And they, I didn't know who these guys were, but they'd fire all the support we needed. And if you can see, this is us. We got, we got a little bit of downtime. We went to different fire bases to protect them. And we'd sit on, they'd be on the top of the hill, and you can see the hill is cleared out. Uh, I think this next one, you can see the top of the hill. The, the other hills are, still have the tree, the vegetation on them. This hill, they just bombed the crap out of it, and then they co co uh, the Corps of Engineers, is that what, who it is, that comes in and, 
and uh, they would clean it all out and try to level out. But we used to always laugh. You can see our positions. We're outside the wire. To the right of that wire is all the artillery. And we'd laugh. We'd say, why are we inside the wire? <laughs> and they'd say, well, you're the infantry. That's your job. And the artillery would tell us if there's a human wave attack and they're coming up the hill, get, make sure you get in that bunker because we are going to fire uh, right at the point point. wire. Point yeah, we're gonna, yeah, they're going to shoot flechette rounds. Flechette rounds are, it's a, a canister with fish hooks in it. And, uh, but that's the bunkers. You can see down below there, that's where we, we would go to sleep. A lot of guys were real touchy about it because the enemy knew if they threw a grenade in there, it could get five guys at once. So a lot of, and I was one of them, I'd sleep right on the, the side there. Uh, I, I, I couldn't sleep right inside there. It just, I was claustrophobic about it. But, and you know, it, you, there was an advantage to it that you got out of the way, but there was also a disadvantage. There's always the yin and yang of everything. This is my lieutenant, Dicely, a rebel. He, uh, he, he ran the whole show. You can see he's doing his homework here. Uh, I talked to him, and like I said, I couldn't have written this book 10 years ago. In fact, it was a, a little less than 10 years this guy wrote this book called Troubled Hero. And it's about uh, this gentleman who won the Medal of Honor. And in fact, we're in about five days from that picture, we flew into this Firebase Marine. And this guy, we went in there, and we really got our butt kicked. We just landing. The helicopters got our butt kicked. And what happened is the one night we split up, one platoon was on the top of the hill, and the enemy came up and, and overran. They smoked a bunch of opium, ran up the hill, and tried to they tried to kill all the lieutenants, the radio men first, and killed the lieutenant first and the radio men right away. And they were doing everything. And this guy, his name was uh, Ken, uh, Ken, uh, Ken, Ken Kays, I don't know how I could forget his name, but he won the Medal of Honor. And the guy called me 10 years ago and said, Don, you were there, what can you tell me about Ken Kays? And I said, I don't, I don't even remember the night. So what he did is he, when all this was happening, he went around while the enemy was blowing everyone up, he started taking care of everyone. And he was running to him and he kept falling over. And he kept falling over and he kept running and he looked down and his leg was blown out. So he put a tourniquet on his leg, shot himself up with morphine, and then went around and took care of everyone. And when the helicopters came in at 5 in the morning, they started bringing choppers in, he put all the wounded on, and he went around and got more wounded. He wouldn't get out, and he lost his leg. Uh, they gave him the Medal of Honor for that. He, unfortunately, 10 years, when he got home, he had a tough time adjusting, and he hung himself. He killed himself, and yeah, the book is about that. Now, he was a conscientious objector, didn't carry a weapon. Didn't, uh, uh, you know, he, it was his first night in Vietnam, and he did all this, and he won the Medal of Honor, his first night in Vietnam. So, but Lieutenant uh, Dicely, why, why I tell you that is, when we went into this operation, about, probably about five days later, we assaulted, we did a combat assault, it was located with this ripcord, we went into a place called Firebase Marine, and there's probably 30 helicopters in the platoon, there's a hundred, there's about, 30-some in the platoon, usually have 45, but we're under strength, and 120 in a, in a company. So our, our whole company, three platoons, went into this fire base, and there were five helicopters at a time dropping us off. Our platoon was first. We get down there, and as we land, every, every landing zone, first of all, they told us, they gave us a speech in the morning, and they said, this place, we bombed it all night, the B-52s hit it, they've blown the crap out of it. So we get there, we land, the enemy is literally sitting there eating lunch. They look at it, because they're used to helicopters going over, and the helicopters go over, and then they just drop down. My radio man shot two guys from me to that screen away, because it was they were that close. And we spent the next, they wouldn't even land any more helicopters. The other 20-some helicopters circled while we tried to clear the area, and we were outnumbered. Eventually, when the platoon got, we were outnumbered 1,200 to our, we had 35 on the ground, and they were just chewing us up. Now, eventually, we got a lot of support and everything, but that lieutenant, the reason I say that is he told me, because of that day, he said, I turned my life over to the Lord. He said, I, he said, if he got me out that day, because I thought we were dead, and he, he was in charge of 2,000 Baptist churches, 
and uh, he was a pretty good guy. He was a pretty, uh, he would, I'd ask him, I, uh, when I was clarifying the story, I said, now when we went up the hill to help, because we, when that platoon got overrun, our platoon came up to help him, and he, uh, I said, I understand you uh, killed, shot two NDA as soon as we got up. He goes, oh no, Don, I didn't shoot him. I killed him with a grenade, and I was saving my ammo so I could kill some more. So, I mean, he may be a Baptist minister, but he knew what it was to stay alive. I mean, he had, to, he had to, uh, the mind to, to do that. But he's a smart guy, played baseball for, I think, Mississippi. But uh, it was good guys like him. That's me about 40 pounds ago. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the sitting on the bunker, and you can see that wire there. But uh, that was just, uh, you know, when you're 19, 20 years old, hey, you know, you can do anything. It's a guy eating sea rations, sea rations. You've eaten them, it's, you know, it's a step above Alpo. Uh, I always thought that was a neat picture. I took that, I don't know who those guys were, but they were artillery guys, but I always thought that that was, a, you know, the agony and the ecstasy or whatever. That's how we shower. That's a shower out in the, it's called an Australian shower. You take that, you heat that water up there, and you pour it in that bucket, and you let it drizzle over you. And so you wash real fast. You don't, you know, you don't sing too many Frank Sinatra songs in the shower. So you get down with it. You can see the wood. Those are old artillery shell canisters there. And there's our toilet. You know, nothing like a little privacy. The, if I, the guy saw the, if these two guys saw this picture now, they'd probably punch me, but they're not here. So... <laughs> But that's, uh, that was our bathroom. Let's just take a little break. You can see the thick jungle. And that's me and Holly. That day that I told you we went into this area when the helicopters were, the, the Spire Base Marine, the Holly was, the, we call him Thumper because he was operating the M79 grenade launcher, which when you shot it, went thump. And so he was always did the rear security. And great guy, really, you know, always be able to walk around. When I first came over the first time in Vietnam, I walked with him, because they don't put you up front, they let you walk in the rear, but you gotta walk in the rear, you gotta watch, the enemy will sneak behind you and sneak up behind you. But we got off a helicopter, we were landing then, and when that, the door gunners are shooting as you're landing, and they're trying to shoot everything in front of you, so they get whatever they can. Well, the helicopter, the front of the helicopter got hit with a, a round, and the pilot, you know, naturally jerked the helicopter. Well, the door gunner went right along with it. Boom, right across his belly, right across his back. And he laid there, and I'll tell you what, when he, we seen him, it, we thought he was a goner. Now, we were able to get helicopters in to get him out, and about, oh, probably three weeks later, I was wounded. And I went to the hospital, and I, we happened to go to Japan. We were in Japan together, and I saw him, and he was literally two hooks right there, and you could just see everything, because they, they wanted to they cut everything away, and they wanted to, to heal from the inside out. They wanted to make sure there's no infection. How but I talked. Get, how did you get wounded? I got hit with a grenade. Uh, we blew up a ammo dump, and uh, it was an MVA ammo dump, and I happened to be on top of it, and it, that's how I got hit with that. But he, he, I talked to him about a few years ago. He lives down in, I think, South Carolina or Louisiana, and he says he has a farm. He's a bricklayer. But he doesn't, he says, Don, I don't ever get off the farm. I'm, I'm happy to be alive and here, and he's a nice guy, great guy. That's the two, that's my rear security and my point man. That's Garner. He also did the point. I told you that Don Goss and him, these guys were both uh, point and rear security. That's Captain Workman and Rebel, which is my lieutenant there, calling in airstrikes. That's one when I was a young kid, you know, walking point and... The, we thought something was going to happen up here. You can see thick jungle. And I said, I think it's going to be, uh, the point man said, hey, we're, we're going to get attacked up here. So I told the lieutenant, the company commander, and he said, well, at that time, the military didn't want to, you could just come call it airstrikes. You had to have probable cause or whatever. So the cap captain said, well, I think there's activity up there. We're going to bomb it. So he called in all these airstrikes. And it was really neat. They called in napalm. And there was the Navy ships. And they'd come in and they'd bring these big 500 pound bombs of napalm and they'd, and they'd be flying. And they'd drop these bombs and you could see the canisters rolling out. And then they, they'd have to put the afterburners in because they had to beat 
they had to beat the canister to the target or they'd get blown up. So it was really impressive to watch. It was funny. You'd see all this and people were scared and everything, but as the bombs were coming in, everybody would put their camera up and take a picture. It was really fun. I wanted to take a picture of that. Captain Workman, nice guy. He was a hardcore guy. He was from West Point. He really had the best of his men in, in mind. He died July 21st, 1970. This Operation Ripcord ended that day, and he, uh, the helicopter was coming in to get him out, and it got shot, and it came down, and it decapitated him. And uh, that was, uh, he was awarded all these medals and everything, but he was a good guy, but that said, these are, the guy in the forefront here is Lamone, the guy in the back there is Ed Forrester. Uh, Ed was my radio man, he carried my radio. And this is just more artillery on Rakasan, that's a fire base. They had fire bases, they put them out, different miles out in the jungle so that you could get support. If you were out in the infantry, you could get some military support. Little interesting stats, three sets of fathers and sons died over there. There were almost 40,000 troops were 22 or younger. Five 16 year olds and one 15 year old died in Vietnam, obviously fake IDs. Uh, 1,400 on their last day, 997 on their first day, 31 sets of brothers died, eight women on the wall. May 1968, when you, Roger, you were there around then, mm -hmm. most killed in one month, 2,415. Now, in World War II, the Normandy invasion was 8,000 died in that one incident, and we've had, I don't know, Iraq and Afghanistan, we've had about 6,000 in 10 years. So, but I tell you, when you lose one, it's, it's terrible. I think our county lost about, the, around 30, 35, I think, our county lost in the war. 997 killed on the first day? Yeah. What, what the first day does that mean? First day out in the field. Oh, I get it. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, first day out in the field. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I know. Okay. I any it. questions? Well, I've learned a lot. Oh, good. I admire all of you. If you were yeah, I, you, you're always here at 101st. So I hope I didn't ruin it by Marine coming. Here. You couldn't say what you really wanted to no, say. No, no. <laughs> hey, let me tell you, they're pretty blunt and they're pretty honest. And, no, it's very but, interesting. Yeah, well, good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Gary, thanks for having me here. I appreciate it. And, and uh, one, one thing that I had heard, and it always struck me, and that's why I remember it, is that some of the older guys, when new guys would come in and they'd get killed, would just think, well, they didn't have to suffer so much being here for a year, you know? Yeah. Like, there was this real callous. Well, it was very callous, and there was a, there was, and there's a lot of callous, like, you know, I, our group, we did laugh a lot. I mean, you, uh, you would, you know, I remember one night we were sitting there, and Monty, 101st Airborne right here. <laughs> I remember uh, the, the bombs of the mortar at four in the morning, they just drop it, you know, and they do this all the time. They, they'll drop about three mortars in on you just to see if you shoot at them. Because they want to see if you shoot, then yeah. you can see the weapon, and that identifies your position. So you got to hold your fire. But, you know, when you're, when you're out there, it's four in the morning, and you all have this little foxhole you build. And when you, before you set up every night, you dig a little hole for yourselves and your two others. Well, the first night, you're scared, and you dig a nice big foxhole, the three of you can fit in. Well, if you don't get activity for a while, that foxhole gets down to, you know, you dig a little bit, and we got mortared. And they dropped the first one, and you hear the thump. It's like going to a 4th of July. You hear that thump, and you know something's going to happen. And, you know, it's 50 meters away, 30 meters away, 20 meters away, and you just see them walking these things in, and the next one's going to hit you. And I would have to say there's that pause of about 10, 15 seconds. The three of us dug that hole. <laughs> In about a minute, we could have dug a base in about 20 minutes. <laughs> but you dig, and, and you know, you're, for the next few nights, you're scared, and you dig another, another big foxhole. But we were in that foxhole. Ed and I, he put this helmet on, and I put my helmet on, and I started laughing at him. I said, Ed, you look just like the guy I'm laughing at. Uh, Artie. Artie, yeah. Artie Johnson. I said, you look just like He goes, hey, you do too. So, I mean, it, there is a, you know, you do have a lot of fun and laughter in it, but I mean, it's gallows humor, without a doubt. But How many yeah, years were you there then? I was just there, I was there from February to May, 
and I was considering, and our, in nine days, in our unit, we lost uh, 65 guys out of 120. It was just such a turnover. They canceled all R&Rs. Did you, did you have to stay there the whole time? You had to be there a whole year. Oh, the, the, okay. You were supposed to, like after, uh, I think after like six, eight weeks, me and the platoon sergeant were going to go to Australia. They canceled it. They said, you're not going anywhere. In fact, they got to the point where guys were saying, I'm re-upping re -up for six years to get out of here. And they, want, they said, you serve your time, and then you can go re-up. So they won't let anybody leave. They were just they were just hurting for people. They won't let anybody go. So. Well, it's tough. When was that? June of seven. That was in uh, February of seventy. I went over there. So, but I was lucky. We did it. We were clearing an area of bunkers. Well, in fact, if we went in the bunker, we went in the bunker, and you could see a bamboo stick there. And I said, "What's that bamboo for?" And the point man said, "He stuck it out, and there was this." Uh, a stream going by, and he stuck that bamboo out and poured himself a glass of water. And that's how they did, because they were worried, they didn't have to leave that, that bunker. They could sneak, they could, the stream was by there, and these bunkers were built very solid. What we were doing, there was an online, we had two guys wounded, we had to bring in helicopters, and so we did an online assault. We had 15 guys running and throwing grenades in bunkers. Well, you try to keep 15 guys aligned, in a jungle, it's tough. It's hard to do it on a, a band to do it on a field. So, you know, I was running around, going to each bunker, trying to make sure everybody was staying on line. See, because if a guy gets too far ahead, somebody sees somebody and they shoot, they'll shoot him in the back. So we, we tried to keep my line, and as I was throwing grenades in these bunkers, most of them, because they were so well built, I just, you know, jumped up a little. And this one, I threw it in, and I said, you know, I'm getting off this sucker. I rolled off, and boy, it went up. It was uh, a bunch of ammo in there. And so that's how I you know, was able to get out of there. They came and they couldn't land. They had to drop a, it's called a jungle penetrator. They drop it down on the ground. They, I hopped on the seat, and I remember as they were hauling it up, and it real slow. And I kept going, you can fly this thing to Cleveland, and I'm not letting go. You know, But I made myself real small, because I had always heard the stories of guys waving, on a helicopter getting shot in the belly. So when they pulled me up, I, you know, I looked like uh, I was a small target. And they, they put me on there, and I, I saw a doctor within 30 minutes. They were real, it was real good. They said being wounded in Vietnam, you got a doctor quicker than if you were in New York City. So. You concur? I concur. All right. How would they know, though, if you were wounded? Well, you have radio. Radio, we had good radios, we always had, we had company radios and we had battalion radios, very good communication. So a helicopter would pick you up then? Yeah, you helicopter. Medivac. medivac. Yeah. And Usually a medivac. Sometimes. Yeah, with a big red cross on it. That meant the enemy wasn't, we didn't have guns on it, but the enemy would just aim for that red cross and try to knock it down. Well, I can see why you had a hard time when you came back. Yeah, so, yes. Yeah, all in all though, I mean, you know, coming back to Ashtabula, you know, there's a, a lot of us just sat down and went and tried to go back to life as it was. Really never talked about it that much. Mm -hmm. Now, Monty, you and I and Jack and all, we were on the same unit. We hardly ever, you know. Because you didn't want to redo it. That's I guess, I don't know. I guess I just, we weren't ready for it. It uh, wasn't publicized like it is today. Uh, actually, we were, we weren't accepted too well coming back. It, it, it was really sad because we were more or less uh, bad guys because we went to. They Vietnam. liked the war and they didn't separate the war from the warrior. And now people may not like the war, but they don't take it out on. They took it out on us. Was it always hot? Oh and yeah, it well, except at night. I tell you what, it got cold at night. Did it, did it rain yeah. a lot? It, it seemed so cold at night because it was so. Yeah, hot. it was, it was just such a change. You it go was, from 110 where I was, to Where I was, 55. there was six months of rain and six months of dry. Oh, wow. Damn rain for six months. So it was... Yeah. The monsoons. The dust, monsoons, the dust yeah. was just as well, bad. Well, we had our month. winter over here, they had monsoons over there. Well, why would they send you to Australia? Is that the closest? Well, that was a place where we could go. It's called R&R. &R. We, oh, we went to Australia. And I'll tell you why we went to Australia. They were one of the few places that would accept Americans, where you wouldn't get abused. Australia was very good. Australia's probably been in more wars than any other country with us. They backed us in more wars. But they were very accepting. That's why you go there, because you don't want to go somewhere where they're going to abuse you. Right. I went there 
to Australia for, for my R&R. &R. I went there mainly because I wanted to hear people talk to English. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to hear English. I did not want to hear any more. Yeah. 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 Donnie, did you well, ask about your book and where they could get it? No, my book is available at Carlisle's in the Harbor and at the Outdoor Army Store. When did you write that? I, didn't know. I wrote it about two years ago. It took about a year and a half. And I tell you, I couldn't have written it until I went to this reunion for this. And I remember, uh, I mean, I don't, like I said, when the guy wrote about that Vietnam, that guy went to the Medal of Honor, I didn't know. Oh, I said, when he asked me, he goes, what'd you do that? I said, I couldn't remember a thing. So I called my platoon sergeant, John Frazier. I said, John, I, I don't remember anything. I said, I, re I remember maybe a minute of the night. And he goes, hey, you remember more than me. I don't remember anything. And that was a relief to me that he, would, he didn't remember anything either. So when I went to this reunion, this Greg Phillips, who's in the book, he's a guy, in fact, I thought for years, when, we went, when I went out the next morning to patrol around the area, there's a lot of dead enemy. And the one had his face completely gone. And what I thought was an M16 will do that. It'll, um, it'll go in like a small 22. it It'll blow like a basketball right out of you. And I thought what happened is he got hit in the back and he just blew his... Well, what, what I found out from him is he was a grenade launcher. And he, he was so close, the guy, he just shot him right in the face. And it was too quick. It didn't ignite the, the trigger, the mechanism to explode it. It just hit him like a big shotgun shell. And so when he, but when I went to there and I said, Greg, and I, he didn't know me, and I, he was in second platoon, and I was in third platoon. You know, you're in the jungle, you don't see hardly anybody, but we introduced uh, ourselves to each other. And I said, Greg, I don't remember hardly any of this. And he said, well, you were in third platoon, you crawled up the hill, and I'll tell you what, when he told me that, I went, whoa, I just remembered that, and that's when I remembered it. I would have never, ever, he just triggered right there. So then I start, that weekend, uh, it was really interesting, I learned a little bit more. And then I got a hold of my Lieutenant Dicely, and I talked to John Frazier, and you start piecing everything a little bit more and more together. What I would do is my brother would tell me to write, so I'd lay in bed at night, and I'd get up at four in the morning, and I'd write. That's smart. Four or five words. And then I'd get up the next day, and i go, and then after that, I could write. And I just, you know, I'm not a great writer. I just put things in. Were there um, any problems with animals or anything? Bugs? Uh, rats. rats. I had more problems with rats at night. If we go into an area that was where a lot of GIs were, there's always a lot of garbage. And I remember one time on recon, we were sitting there at night, and we, we put our food out there, we put the cans out, so it would be another way of the enemy hearing us. Well, boom, the sun sets, we hear this crunching, and here's these rats are eating the cans. Well, they ran out of the food in the cans, and on your pack you have food. You could hear them scratching on the pack, and you... You couldn't shoot them because you didn't want the enemy to know where you're at. So we were up all night knocking these rats around, and we were, we were so hot, you know, we were bitter that we, we slept in a garbage dump, basically. So we got up that day and moved out, but rats were the big thing. I think leeches was my Oh, big. Leeches. leeches were terrible. Yeah. Uh, I was in the mountains a lot, and uh, in the, during the monsoons, you'd try to go to sleep, and, and you would wake up feeling something sucking away at you, and you just... You get you get your everybody had a, a, zi a zippo lighter. Yeah. You get your buddy to light the lighter and start burning them off you. Wow. Because you can't knock them off. The heads will be in you. Yeah. You got you got to burn them off. You got to have them draw they themselves back wrong. out. Sort of sliding. Well, yeah, they're real. Yeah, and that's what I had. I had a rip in my pants, and that's what I was walking around. I felt real sluggish, and I looked down and I went, oh, and I got a rip, and I seen a couple of leeches. And I dropped my pants, and then everybody in the you know, my area came over and started burning them off. Yeah, that's but they just burn them off. Yeah, and uh, when was the Vietnam Wall constructed? Well, I think it was like 19... 1982. Yeah, to me, that was the most outstanding thing. Yeah, it really is impressive to go down and see. And I grew up in D.C. and yeah, we, we were living there at one time, and I can remember going through. Not one person said one word, and then they had the book to look up people. I mean, it was. Eerie. Oh, well, yeah. of course, you felt yeah. awful. It is, it was, uh, it is, uh, you know, it's a different than all the other memorials down there. And Vietnam was a little different than all the other yeah, wars. It sure was. And, uh, but I think we learned our lesson, because you can see now, Monty, they don't treat the military anything like before. Oh, no, no. Uh, the guys come home today, they're heroes. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I do know friends that passed away and died over there. I mean, they didn't give them an inch of. I seen the, the headlines of some of them. They didn't. They wrote like it was nothing. They didn't. We had, like I say, over thirty in this county, and they won't write hardly anything about it. Did you so take? They, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Don't. No. Did you have a camera then? Did you well, I had. A, I had quite a few cameras. They kept getting blown up. But I had a lot. I lost a lot of film there because they. <laughs> the rats. They were. They were. <laughs> I kept telling them, "Hey, I'm taking pictures here. Leave me alone." But they. I wish I would have taken a lot more. Did you ever have yeah. any communication from your family? Oh uh, yeah, we had got mail. You got mail, and I remember the first of the month, they would bring out the payroll officer and they'd pay you right there, hmm. and they did it for morale and purposes. What did you do with it? Couldn't do anything with it. <laughs> Couldn't do anything. Just put in your. People was I had most of it sent home, sent home, but I put like fifty bucks in my and uh, you got to put in a little. You had a little plastic bag. You put it in there, and when you get back to the rear, you can buy some beer. People wouldn't steal it. No, nobody. Remember, I had a rifle. They had a rifle. Yeah. So <laughs> I was on. I was well, on a mission like where today, a guy right? went in the middle of a What's that? I was on a mission where a guy, a guy went in the middle of a barn. Yeah. 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 Pretty impressive. I mean, these people that yeah. do these things. It's. I can remember as a kid. I'm a lot older than probably most people in here. I was living in D.C. during the war, and my father was a warden. You know, the sirens would go off, black guy curtains would come down. Of course, I was scared to death. Yeah. I lived across from the zoo. My greatest fear, if I got bombed, and the animals came after me, what would I do? I was going to, we had a big bookcase. I was going to climb up there yeah. on the top. But I can remember when the war ended, and I was, I was pretty young. But anyway, yeah. we went downtown D.C., and oh, I've never seen anything so happy. Yeah. Now. Well, that would be a good time. That's for sure. Oh, boy. But yeah, we mostly, like, I came home on a, a medical ship, so I was just all through the back doors of everywhere. And I do remember them sometimes telling us, if, you know, if you don't have to, don't wear your uniform in public. And they tell us that. So we try to sneak in and well, sneak that's out. very sad. No wonder everyone had a hard time. Yeah, it's, it's you know. I got into civilian clothes right after I got it done at Fort Lewis. I, yeah. didn't, want, I didn't want my uniform on anymore. Yeah. Because they, you still people, have it? Spitting at you, That's saying true. things, calling you baby killers, and it was terrible. It was terrible to come home where a, 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 a serviceman comes home today and he's he's a he's a hero. Whether he was in supply on the front line, he's a hero. We came home and we were we were bad because. Well, you all were so young when you went too. Oh, I was I was 19, yeah. 19 years old when I come home. Yeah, <laughs> just. Uh, yeah, it was just a bad time. It was just, just a bad time. That's the media all. really, uh, they blew the media, it up. Yeah, the media, yeah, media good. But uh, like I said, I think... Well, with Kent State going on and everything, it was just really like... I came home right after Kent State. Kent State happened uh, May, of, May 1970. of 1970, and I came home July of 70. And I can remember reading about Kent State when I was still over there, and I'm thinking, what is going on with this world? Yeah. We're yeah, over here fighting right. for our people back home, and they're killing our own people back home because of this war. And yeah. I just, it blew my mind when I read about Kent State. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. sad. And I had just spent two weeks at Kent State before I went over. I was with Jimmy Lambrose and Al Sidbeck. And we were, you know, drinking down there. And so when people, they'd say, hey, Shaughnessy, you, uh, you know anything about Kent? And I, yeah. And I said, I was just there. And they listed the names. I said, don't know them. I didn't mean to be callous, but, you know. So all of you got drafted in those days. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, they were taking about 50 a month. Mm -hmm. Well, my husband was different age, and but he was drafted as soon as he got out of college. Yeah. Uh, this, I wasn't married then. Yeah. But Usually made them, uh, if they were had a college degree, they could become a, a lieutenant or well, something like that. He was drafted. He was a private. Oh, okay. Wow. So. You know. Any other questions? That was very interesting. I oh, hope thanks. you didn't mind me being here. No, no. <laughs> These guys are all questions. interesting. Everyone has a, a little story to tell. I mean, it really is interesting. Well, I would think it would have been very hard for you to even talk about it for a long time. Well, you know, there's a lot I still don't remember. We so. were, we, in, in the 70s, I didn't care about nothing. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't even, you know, I didn't even think about it. I didn't. I didn't think because about it. Because it was sort of behind Because you. it was, yeah, yeah. because I, I didn't care about 
anything going on. Well, you're 19, 20 years old. We had other things on our mind, and that's, you know, we just want to have a good time. And, sure, you were young. And, you, and at that time, and plus there was a ton of us that went there. And it was just like, suck it up. You, you know, this is what people did, and this is what you do. And well, get you on think of life. Afghanistan, and that's such a rugged area. It's all rocks. A horrible area. Yeah, you wonder how they protect each other there. Yeah, like the VFW, when you got back, they those guys didn't want to. The average they soldier, the World War II guys, didn't want us in the VFW. They, the they did not we want kidding. us in the VFW. No. We weren't we weren't considered a war. We Can you go in there now? Oh yeah. Well, yeah. we were technically you could we could go in there. You get a they free just didn't want us. The Elks, the veterans, all of you would get a free dinner, right? Veterans oh, every dinner. veteran day, yeah. yes, yes. But uh, the average soldier in World War II had forty days of combat. In Vietnam, the average infantry soldier in one year had 240 days because the helicopters, the mobility in Vietnam now was, there'd be an action, boom, you're in a helicopter and you're going out to it. You said it took 18 hours to get there, was that a straight 18 flight? hours, yeah, you go to, I went from Fort Lewis, Washington to Hawaii, right. to Guam, okay. to I think Cameron Bay. Wake. Wait, you didn't stop at Wake Island? No, we stopped at Guam. We went, we went to uh, Fort Lewis, Hawaii, Guam, Wake Island, then Cameron Bay. Oh. We had one extra stop. I had to go, wow. to, I had to, go into Okinawa every time I came or went from Hawaii. I, I never was in Okinawa. Marine Corps had a well, station there. Yeah, I remember going into Hawaii and the pilot saying, <laughs> you're not allowed to go to the bars that are located at gate 26, 22. He listed all the bars that you said, well, I don't want you going to these bars. And he listed all the gates. And, Everybody got off the plane because they had to, we had about three hours of boat right in the water. <laughs> That's exactly what we did. We yeah. had uh, 247 guys on the, it was a commercial flight that left Fort, Fort Lewis. Yeah. And we stopped in Hawaii and I think out of 247, I think 235 hit the bar. Yeah. And when we came back to the plane, all they did was pass off doggy bags. Yeah. Or bark Same. bags. But uh, one thing I want to say is, uh, we had a commercial flight flying into Cameron Bay, and we had uh, stewardesses. Yeah, we did too. And when we landed at Cameron Bay, we got mortared. We didn't know what was we didn't even know what was going on. I was looking yeah. out the window, and I'm seeing flashes. And the stewardesses, all I could hear was the stewardesses crying. With that, they had their heads between their legs in the yeah. crash position, and we're we're taxiing on the runway, and the runway is getting mortared, and I'm more or less to say. Welcome, Welcome to Vietnam. Yeah. <laughs> then they pick you up in a bus, and there's chicken wire on all the windows. Yeah. And you go, what? What's the Fire chicken wire for? Fire. And they said, because the little kids will throw grenades in. Oh, no, man. Here we go. <laughs> well, I'm glad you all are here. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.